This is a 1958 Silvertone um, that's been uh, it had the once overdone in uh, Athens, Georgia. A fellow named Scott Baxendale takes these old guitars and he gives them a special little touch. Speaking of which, I got here on 72. Um, the desert is perfect for lazy bastards. I was born in Pennsylvania, uh, mistakenly, apparently, and nature uh, took a hand in uh, washing me this way where the rest of the lazy bastards found comfort in cluster. Uh, there was a flood in our little town in Pennsylvania in 72 from Hurricane Agnes and six feet over the roof of our house washed that away. And my dad had remarried out here, so I'm extremely thankful for the two greatest disasters in my life, my folks' divorce and Hurricane Agnes. Once out here, um, I met a fella came out here when I was 15, and a few years later, I met a fellow named Reiner Thotchek. See, this is the segue from a, a fellow who put the juju in guitar fixings. Reiner worked here first at the guitar workshop, and then a little place downtown here where I bought my first electric. That's now the Ronstadt Center. I can't remember the name of the shop there. And then eventually came Caddy Corner to the old Chicago music store and he worked down in the basement. <laughs> um, Reiner and I came, he was five years older than me, but Reiner and I came to America the same year. Him by boat, me by birth canal. He ended up in Chicago and I ended up in uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania until the flood, and then uh, we both came here in 72, but we didn't meet each other until 76. Reiner, while he was in Chicago, uh, started playing the dobro. Reiner, I didn't know this at the time until we would tour Europe for the first time in 1986, and uh, we were on our way to Berlin back when we had to drive through East Germany. We realized the night before in Hamburg that Reiner was born in East Berlin and that there might be an issue crossing the border. They might not have had enough slide players in East Germany and want them back. So we had to fly him into uh, West Berlin. And, uh, and that's when I began to understand him a little bit more, all those uh, 10 years after I met him when we were on tour the first time. We started a band. Uh, I started playing with him in 1976. Um, I was on a, the thing about the desert, I think, besides the art of being a lazy bastard, the whole point of that is to be so comforted by the minimalism and the unending space. That's what uh, appealed to me, I guess, because uh, Ever since then, my music has had an unending space and uh, uh, a minimalism, um, kind of like uh, the way comedians, the best comedians tell a joke and uh, they leave a little something for you to fill in the lines yourself. It, this music is like that. It doesn't explain everything to you. You need to take part in it. So... We got together, I met him at the Helen Street Cafe one night. Um, I was on a three day uh, psychedelic excursion. It was, a, it was the last day, I just saw Roman Polanski's The Tenant. And uh, have you ever seen that? Uh, this is before computer animation and uh, uh, there was uh, some serious um, scenes at the end there where the audience was project 
perceived as demons while poor Roman was trying to kill himself and they had serpent tongues and all the like. Right after that, I went to, <laughs> I remembered I was supposed to meet this fellow named Reiner at the Helen Street Cafe. I was living on Helen Street in Park at the time and the woman who invited me to meet him was named Helen. This is the other thing about Tucson is uh, it has a curious amount of coincidences that uh, occur. They don't mean anything. <laughs> but they are appealing and when enough of them happen at one time, uh, you know you're on the right track or you just keep following the path you, like breadcrumbs. So I got there and Reiner uh, invited me up, uh, up to play while he was playing. Now he's playing a dobro and I was just 19 at the time and uh, he was 24 and um, I, I would try to get out of it and I said I can only play in G and that's what his dobro was tuned in so that was no problem so we jammed and the thing is the piano was facing the wall and probably I figured it out years later decades later it was because of that film but I couldn't stop the song I couldn't stop playing because I didn't want to face the crowd as small as that place was and uh, Reiner was okay with that. So we played for 45 minutes in the key of G, maybe two chords. The song changing, evolving, never being the same. It was uh, what an Escher print would sound like. <laughs> and then I heard the guy who owned the place empty out the joint. And then once everybody left, we... we we, we brought the puppy in for landing, and that was it. That's how me and Reiner bonded, just like that. That's how we met. It wasn't until um, he came down with brain cancer in 96, uh, so 10 years after that. No, sorry, 20 years after that, and uh, 10 years after we first toured in Europe in 86. And he saw, we looked over the wall, and he saw his old neighborhood in East Berlin in, in 86. In 96, he came down with a brain cancer, and he was going to pass away before 97 was, uh, was uh, finished. And um, uh, that kind of threw me in a tailspin for quite some time. He's been with me ever since. Um, but anyhow, so... Uh, he, he was drawn to uh, the Dobro because his father was a, of Czech descent. The name Thacek means small bird. His mother was German. And um, he explained to me uh, how the, the Dobro was invented by these five Czech brothers that came to America to create a, an instrument with a built-in speaker to compete with the big band sounds before they had amplification. And uh, um, it was the Dopia brothers, and they would argue amongst themselves and splinter off, and they would build the national guitars, which he also played, the Duolian, and then eventually they would make these silver tones and airline guitars, and a lot of cool guitars in the 60s. And, um, I'm not sure what the point of any of that was. Um, I just turned 60 on this stage a week ago, and so I'm uh, I'm enjoying the cool, cool breezes here in the foothills of dementia, I'm waiting for that lovely storm to kick in one day and relieve me of. Too many ideas and memories. So we got together in uh, in '76, and um, we started what, a band that would become Giant Sand. First, it was the Giant Sand Worms. It was an easy crowd. Uh, and along the way, I was. Uh, 22 or 23 at the time when we finally got it going and then he found a drummer who was about 20 named Billy Settlemeyer and and then a, another guitar player who would switch off on bass named Dave Seeger who was 19 
and uh, and and we started this band, Giant Sandworms, in Reiner's house, and we played a little tiny place on Fourth Avenue called Tumbleweeds. They were it was you know it was uh, can you say shithole? <laughs> it was the only place that would allow bands of our ilk, post-punk bands at the time, and. Um, but one of the most monumental things here, uh, um, and this is what I'm getting at, X played there. Yeah, the band from Los Angeles called X. They made these cool uh, mementos for the band. And uh, as coincidence would have it, John Doe and X scene from the band X were here on this stage one week ago on said birthday, um, as they were in Tumbleweeds back in 1980. And they were very important because very few bands came to Tucson, and here's the whole point. Uh, we were in the middle of nowhere. Um, all the bands stopped in Phoenix. Nobody came here much. And there was no college radio. It was the only... Uh, decent-sized university town that had no un college radio that played you new music. The, our station still plays. Now I'm thankful for it. They play a lot of jazz and classical, but there was no station here. Uh, KXCI finally came around in 1983, but, but even then, they didn't just play new music. They had maybe one show would play something new, and they played a lot of traditional stuff, and uh, all kind of, they, a great spectrum of stuff, but we didn't get any information here. We were a city without um, the usual influence, especially with a university sitting here like that with 30,000 people. So what had happened was we, there was only one record shop called the Record Room on 4th Avenue, and they would get, you know, a couple copies of whatever was new in, but that was it. If you got there too late, you missed out on the New Germs record which might have been a good thing. But the point is that what happened back then in the late 70s was we all of post-punk descent started coming up with our own kind of music that we couldn't buy. It was kind of like Sonic Pioneers making your own clothes with Sonic threads. So, and you know, some, no, set of clothing looked the same amongst the bands, you know, as everybody had their own sound. Nobody could play or sing very well, because that was the punk ethic. It was all a matter of attitude and getting it done. It wasn't about destruction, it was just about uh, punching through gravity and getting buoyant. Um, and this was the perfect place to do it. This was at a time when burritos cost $1.25. When you didn't just have Dos Equis, you had Tres Equis. Does anybody remember Tres Equis beer? All right, well, you can get a bottle of it with a dollar twenty-five bean burrito at El Dorado, right there on South Fourth. And uh, so it was a perfect Petri dish. Well, we didn't know it at the time. We just thought it was a cheap place to live. And perfect for the lazy bastard inside of us that slept all day with aluminum foil on the windows and stayed up all night and went down to the washes and took whatever libation was handy. And this is how the indie rock scene in this neck of the woods um, blossomed or at least came to be. And then it wasn't until the 90s where indie rock became a real thing. In the 90s, small labels uh, weren't swallowed up by the bigger labels like they were in the 80s. And lo-fi, thankfully, became a tangible order of the day, audibly speaking, in no small part to the advent of a band called Sm Sparkle Horse, which made it so palatable and almost pop-like. And that's when things got really healthy. You can be on a label and get a 50-50 split after expenses and um, in the meantime, we had lived in various different places. We tried living in Lower East Side in 1981 when it was precarious on Avenue B and 3rd Street.
playing CBGBs. I don't know how many times. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm done. So it's been really nice talking to you all. <laughs> I'll, I'll play you one chord, one chord, which will <laughs> hopefully represent the sound. This is pretty much the sound of this town to me. I mean, you know, the human sounds are great here, but I was more impressed with the elemental sounds of the desert, the erosion of, the, of this place, which sounds to me just like this. There you have it. Thanks for having me.